Welcome back to the History of Necromunda, and this time we're doing the first episode of the series that isn't an edition of the game, and also where I can't build an Orlock gang. In this video, we're going to talk about the way Necromunda was expanded during the first edition, and the biggest initial expansion, Outlanders. <laughs> Outlanders was a supplement released in 1996 for Necromunda, and it was a really big deal. It expanded the game in a few different ways, from new gangs, new characters, rules for outlaws, and ideas for running bigger games. The big boxed expansion was quite a common occurrence in the mid-90s. Games Workshop would tend to release the big starter set for a game, and then, to keep up interest, release a big boxed expansion six months or a year later, usually featuring a book of new rules and loads of extra cards and templates. Dark Millennium expanded the Psychic phase for Warhammer 40k, Death Zone added new teams to Blood Bowl, Plague Fleet and Seas of Blood added new fleets to Man of War. I should do a video on Man of War, I love Man of War. Well, Outlanders was that, but it was really tightly planned with the original Necromunda release. The very first designer's notes on the release of Necromunda in White Dwarf 190 mention what Outlanders is going to include, and it was released just five months after the main box. The set was relatively light on cards and tokens for one of these things, and contained some tox markers, additional terrain pieces, one with a lift and one watchtower, and then the Outlanders rulebook. The terrain was fine, a couple of handy elements to expand your board, but it was really Really the book we were all after. The biggest thing in Outlanders is the expansion of the rules beyond the six house gangs and into some of the weirder groups that inhabit the hive. The four new gangs, Redemptionists, Scabbies, Ratskin Renegades, and Spirers, are all considered outlaws in the Underhive, so the book starts with the rules for outlaw gangs. Becoming an outlaw is relatively simple. After a game, players could report each other to the Watchman, and the accused player rolled 2d6 on the outlaw table. Most of the time nothing would happen, and if you'd never done anything wrong, you were pretty safe, even maybe deputy into Watchmen, but there's a lot of modifiers that could pile up over time. So why is it so bad to be an outlaw? Well, in-game it's not that bad, but there are a load of changes to the post-game sequence that happen. First, outlaw gangs keep one piece of territory and have to abandon the rest. That seems bad, but the flip side is that outlaws don't have to filter their income through the income table, instead they just get it all. However, an outlaw gang has to find three creds per member after each game to keep food and bullets on the table, otherwise their gangers start to starve, and that has an effect on the game. That might be worth the risk, especially if you have an Architect Horde or something, and if you steal a territory off another player, you have the option to just loot it for all it's worth. But lose your territory after a bad defeat, and you'd have to roll on the outlaw territory table to generate another, and they're not very good. Outlaws are also worth a bounty. If any of your models is captured, they can be sold to the guilders by the other player. It is possible to regain your gang's good name and lose your outlaw status, but only after paying a hefty fee. Outlaws also had to trade at the Outlaw Trade Post, a black market with some more dubious items and a chance that you get cheated or robbed while you were there. Maybe worth it if you were in the market for some illicit spook though. Finally, there was a whole new set of outlaw scenarios, which prioritised hit and run and loot finding missions. Generally, playing as an outlaw gang was swingier. The rewards could be big, but life was also a lot more precarious. The four new gangs were all outlaw gangs. In fact, they were outlanders, which just meant they were permanently outlaws and could never buy off their status. Scavies are the very dregs of humanity. Though they're so devolved and twisted, they can hardly be considered human anymore. Severely deformed and often mutated by the toxic environment they live in. Scavies dressed in rags and are caked in the most indescribable foulness. Their skin is a yellow and disgusting mass of sores, warts, blisters and cracks. Their limbs often so withered and shriveled that crude hooks and peg legs are a common sight. Though any scavy too crippled to defend himself is easy prey for his fellows. So scavies are a sort of comedy mutant ghoul force from the most toxic parts of the Underhive, made up of cheap and terrible regular gangers who could be upgraded with mutations and take ramshackle weapons like the blunderbuss or tox bombs. They're accompanied on the field by scalies, a stable mutation of lizard-like big guys who act as heavy weapon specialists, and hordes of plague zombies, at the bargain price of 10 credits for d6 zombies in a game, and they act as a random shambling screen for you. Scavy gang would be pretty big, so handily, if it looked like they were about to starve, they could just eat a prisoner, or one of your own gang. <laughs> if that's all a bit too sinful for you, well, maybe you prefer a life of quiet religious contemplation. 
The cries of the redemptionist movement resound through the hive in a hot pulse of anger. On street corners and boulevards, redemptionist preachers rally the masses with their clarion call of intolerance and hatred. In packed meeting halls, redemptionist priests lead the populace in prayers of more hatred and intolerance and xenophobia, calling for the emperor's divine wrath to descend upon the galaxy. So the Redemptionists are a crazy doomsday cult within the Imperial faith. Technically so extreme they're illegal, but covertly practiced throughout the Hive. They're also a nod to Laserburn, the 15mm tabletop game Warhammer 40k evolved from, We're about and to which go Snipe and Whip have a really good video Laser about. Burn is a and Redemptionists of a slightly different flavour had appeared as a Warhammer regiment of renown a few years prior. Games Workshop love to squeeze a crazy religious cult in wherever they can. Anyway, these Redemptionists travel around the Underhive led by Redemptor priests who could try and convert captured house gangers. The rest of the Crusade, as gangs were known, consisted of deacons who performed the role of heavies, though Redemptionists didn't really use heavy weapons, brethren who were your gangers and juves, and zealots, a sort of gang champion with frenzy and uh, fantastic haircuts. As an underground organisation, the Redemptionists got access to their own slightly better territory table, including arms caches and sympathetic settlements, but they had to move on each game to stay one step ahead of the Guilders. Redemptionists also got access to some special weapons. Exterminator cartridges were one-shot flamers that could be strapped onto another weapon, and they saw the first ever sighting in the 40k world of this thing, the Eviscerator. Third up, we get the Ratskin Renegades. Ratskin Scouts had already been included as a higher gun in the basic set, but Outlanders expanded them into a gang. Ratskins are normally a shy, peaceful people who are inclined to avoid the noisy, raucous downhivers and their settlements. Sadly, the Ratskins' peaceful ways make them vulnerable to exploitation by unscrupulous guilders or gangs. Outlaws may run riot and murder a whole Ratskin settlement, leaving a few embittered survivors, thirsting for vengeance on all hivers. These fierce Ratskins turn their backs on their own people and become renegades, hunting and killing the hivers wherever they can to cleanse the underhive of intruders. So look, if the underhive is intended to be a sort of wild west frontier, I guess these guys are the most obvious sign of that. Ratskins are quite obviously a very crude analogy for Native Americans, and yeah, it, it's a bit clumsy nowadays. I mean, there's probably a reason you haven't seen this gang in modern Necromunda yet. Ratskins lie somewhere between the ramshackle nature of a scavy gang and a more organised house gang. They're led by a Ratskin chief who is particularly resilient to hive things. In fact, the whole gang are remarkably resilient to any dangerous underhive flora and fauna. The rest of the gang is made up of Ratskins, Braves, who are kind of like Juves, and the Ratskin Shaman, who gets a sort of psychic power from the spirit lore table. As well as regular weapons, weapons, they get access to muskets and hand bows. It's actually nice to see a hand bow back in 40k from their rogue trader days. And they're actually pretty useful in some of the ambush scenarios. There aren't many weapons in Necromunda that are silent. But other than that, there's not a lot to the Ratskins. I feel like they were an idea that the designers thought would be really cool for the setting, but maybe not a very well thought out and differentiated game concept. And finally, even in the living nightmare of the Underhive, the Spirers are spoken of with a shudder. Parents scare small children into obedience with mention of their name, and grown men fall silent at tales of their attacks. To Underhive dwellers, they are demons of the darkness, blood-soaked fiends that prey upon warring gangs without compunction or pity. Spire Hunters, or Spirers, are the most deviant gang here. They're kind of a reimagination of the old confrontation Brat Gang. They're the young scions of noble houses from the Spire, come down to the Underhive to hunt their lessers as a sort of coming of age ritual. And in order to do that, they are equipped with ancient heirloom suits of armour. There are four broad types of armour. The Jakara is lightly armoured and emphasises speed and agility. The Yeld has long range weapons and wings. The Malkador, which is kind of like a Spider-Man suit. And the Aurus, a brutal oversized suit with power fists and bolt launchers. Each of these guys is pretty expensive in credits, so you generally only have four or five in a gang. And since they don't collect income, don't need food and don't trade, they're all you're going to get. Instead of trading for new and better weapons, their suits get better and unlock new abilities as their experience level goes up. Spira gangs also have a limited shelf life. They're on a mission to prove themselves, and so when you build the gang, you give them a vow, either to kill a certain number of gangers, amass a certain amount of experience, or survive a certain number of games. Once they complete this, they go back up hive. 
Basically, Spiras are a really simplified gang. Designed, I think, either as your second gang or maybe for an experienced player who can't turn up as often to the campaign. So that's your four Outlanders gangs, each of which are pretty iconic by now. But that's not where the Outlanders book stops. There's loads more in this. The number of hired guns is increased. In addition to the Bounty Hunter, Scum and Ratskin Scout from the main set, Outlanders introduces Pit Slaves and Weirds, which come in four flavours. Pyromaniac, Telekinetic, Telepath, and everyone's favourite, the Beastmaster. It also introduces the concept of special characters, who can be either hired for a single game, or might come in as a mentor if the difference in gang ratings is particularly high. The book includes rules for the Arc Zealot of the Redemption, King Redwart the Magnificent of the Scavies, Mad Donna Yolanti, the famed Pit Fighter and obligatory Spartacus clone Bull Gorg, the renegade Ratskin Brakar the Avenger, and everyone's favourite plague zombie loving undead Necro King Karloth Valwar. In addition, the book includes rules for treacherous conditions, some tips on running campaigns by arbitrator Andy Chambers, and some arbitrator scenarios which are intended for big multi-gang battles, like Purge, where multiple gangs are banded together to clear out a dome, and a deck of playing cards is used to generate all the gribbly creatures that could appear, anything from giant bats to plague bearers to Eldar scouts. The book also includes a pretty extensive underhive bestiary for making your own. So Outlanders was a massive expansion to Necromunda. But the expansions didn't end there. White Dwarf ran pretty regular Necromunda articles, including the first rules for Adeptus Arbitez, but the majority of new rules were published in either the Citadel Journal, Gang War Magazine, or Necromunda Magazine, which kind of succeeded each other and there was a bit of reprinting between them. Anyway, there were loads of new rules in these, from the expansion of the setting into the Ash Wastes, to new hired guns and gangs, to absolutely tons of new missions. So, in a break from scheduled programming, that's what I'm going to be doing next time. A selection of interesting things from those magazines before we move on to Necromunda's second edition. Thanks for watching.